Well, Happy New Year to everyone, and what a Happy New Year's it's been already, and this is only day one of what God has in store for you and for me and for this church. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to be picking up essentially where we left off last week with the theme of God changing up some stuff. Um, For many, many weeks now, God has been stirring in my heart, preparing this message, preparing the theme for 2023, and what I feel the Lord's put upon my heart is written on your bulletins already, but do a new thing in me in 2023. And when I wrote those words down, I asked the Lord to show me what exactly that meant to each one of us. To do a new work in me, what does that truly mean to us? And as we go through this message today, I hope that you have a better understanding about what that truly means. And Alan, I do appreciate you stepping out of the box and starting out this service the correct way of doing something new, something amazing, something that you've not usually do on your own. But the Holy Spirit's working through me, he's working through you, and he's working through all of us collectively to do something brand new, not just in this building. This building is where we come together to celebrate what God's been doing. The reason for the church is to go out and be the church outside of these walls, to show Christ anywhere and everywhere that he places us, whether that be at the ball games or at the, at the market or anywhere else, to be the church, to be loving, to being caring, to being kind and generous everywhere that we go. And sometimes we get in the way and we say, God, I only want to show the world this much of you. This message is designed to take the cap off of where God has you right now and where God wants to put you. God's not happy. He's not satisfied for where you're at right now. He wants you to take you to deeper waters, greater things, and with greater expectation. I hope you're prepared for this. I did not install the seat belts this morning for you guys so you didn't fall out of your chairs, but I think if you want to jump up and holler, feel free, all right? Amen. Before we dive into the Word, I do want to pray. I pray that God speaks directly to your heart, that he uses me as his vessel to bring bring forth the word of God to change your life. These words that I speak have no meaning in them unless the Lord is with them. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is an honor and a privilege to stand behind this pulpit. I ask you, God, to anoint me, to fill me, and to use me to speak your truth. God, I pray that you open the ears and the hearts and the minds of every single person listening to this message, either today or in the future. I pray, God, that you transform us to be more Christ-like in every way. I thank you, Father. I love you, and I praise you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. For many weeks now, I know the Lord has been telling us to come together in one spirit, one body, one accord. And I love watching God orchestrate this right before my eyes. Just talking to individuals throughout the week and hearing the stories about how you've connected with other people within the body, going to lunch or having a, 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 a coffee break with them, whatever, or a phone call. That is you guys being the church, and this is a great step in the right direction, and God's not done yet. Because as more people come into our church, and we're going to see great and tremendous growth, I know that. God's already spoken, He's shown it, it's happening. We need to make sure that we, our hearts are ready to meet that new need. And by that I mean this, we're going to have to step up our game with Christ. God's going to ask more things from us. He's going to ask for more time, more attention, more love, more forgiveness. That's not always easy to give away. Right now, do a new thing in me in 2023 needs to be our slogan for our hearts now and forever. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like stagnant. I don't like stale. I like fresh and new. Amen. You know, you think about like the freshness in our, in our lives, you know, when Angie changes the sheets on the bed and there's the smell of the fresh sheets. I like that. That's fresh. You know, it's, it's clean. It's new. It's something that's going on. It's awesome. You know, that it just like, it doesn't, it just feels better around you, right? A fresh cooked meal always tastes better than leftovers, except for chili. Chili's pretty good leftover. <laughs> Got to throw in the disclaimers, Right? 
But I'm tired of the stale and the mundane. I'm tired of those things, especially spiritually. I want something new from God. Talking with Crystal before church today, we were talking about you know, the, the Word of God, how it comes alive to us. We were talking, also Dewey was there, and he was talking about how he has, you know, scribbles in his, in his Bible about what the Lord's speaking to him about this passage. And then he reads it again next year, and he has to write something else because it's something different. And then before you know it, well, how did I even get to the first part? Because it makes no sense. It has nothing to do with the Scripture because it's fresh and new every single day. This is what the Lord wants to do inside your heart today. Do something new, something crazy, something that you didn't expect. But he's waiting for you today to step out of your comfort zone and say, God, do something new inside of me. Our opening passage is Isaiah 43, beginning with verse 18 and 19. This here has been just illuminating to my heart every single time I look at this in the last few weeks. Here's what the Lord says. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Funny thing about desiring new things and wanting new things. The only way we can get there is being tired of the old things. Being done with the old stuff. Being ready to receive and grab a hold of the new things. You know, many of us are familiar with the prodigal son and the story therein. You know, the younger son took the inheritance that the dad had for him and just ran wild with it for a while. Parting it up, buying whatever, living high on the hog, if you want to call it that for a moment. Plenty of friends, as long as the money held out. But there came a time when the money ran out the glitz and the glamour of what the world had to offer lost its sparkle and its charm. And this young man found himself broke, in despair, hungry, even stealing from pigs to find his way. I love the part of the story where he says, you know what? I'm done with that. The servants in my, in my dad's house lives better than I do. But he had to get tired of his old life before he would make that change. Too many people want to sit in the hog pen and grovel and complain about why things aren't better. They're not tired of it yet. It's time for us to get tired of our old life and say, God, what do you have to offer that's better than this? Because here's the great thing. As soon as this son did that, he goes, you know what? I'm going home. I'm going back to the Father where I belong to see what could happen there. And here's what the story tells me. He says, when the father seen the son in a far off distance, he raised the alarm bells going, my son's home. Kill the fattened calf, we're going to have a party. And he ran and met his son on the road. See, the Lord's waiting with anticipation in his heart, saying, will you turn around and run back to me? Will you change? Will you say, I want to change up my life? Will you change me? He's waiting right now for you to make that decision. This is your opportunity. This is your moment in time to see what God can do in your whole new year. This is kind of unique to have on Christmas on a, on a Sunday and New Year's on a Sunday. It doesn't happen every year that way. But God has placed us here this morning to hear this message, to say, you know what? I'm going to believe for new things in this year. Too many times we write down our New Year's resolution about this and this and this, and then next year we do the same list because we failed at it. This year, I don't want to have this list again next year. I want to see us say, yeah, God did do a new thing. He wants, I want God to change your life and my life. I want him to change the dynamic of Price County and all of northern Wisconsin. He wants to do it through you if you would let him. Now, the choice is yours. Are you tired of the old mundane or you're ready for something brand new? That choice is completely on you. The Lord's here to tell you, yeah, he's ready and willing to do it if you would step out in faith. Now, the, the, the passage I just read about the uh, forget the former things, I can see two different sides of that coin, honestly. We also sometimes, in the Christian sex, se sector of things, we kind of get stagnant in our worship. We get stagnant on the way we worship and the songs that we sing and you know, we, we, we sang this song in 1976. We should still sing the song today. Yeah, it's still a powerful song, don't get me wrong, but the Lord also says, sing to me a new song, right? 
Not because the old song was bad, but he wants to see something fresh and new from us. And maybe we need to say, okay, God, you did a work in me in 1973. All right? What can you do today? And so too many times, especially seasoned veterans of the faith, they get into a rhythm or a habit or a rut, believing that God has put them in a place, and this is where they're going to be the rest of their life. I'm standing proof to tell you that what God's doing with you today is not always what he's going to do with you tomorrow. Back in 2011, when I was you know, doing youth, that's all my mind consisted of. I did not see myself as a senior pastor. I did not see myself anywhere else except for a youth pastor. But all of a sudden, back in 19, or 2018, God spoke to me and says, I'm about to do a new thing in you. Be ready. That's all I got. Be ready. Ready for a change. All of a sudden, one night, boom, I had to prepare my heart. God, what are you going to do in here? And sometimes you guys get stuck saying, okay, I've always been this in the church. I've always been that in the ministry. Ask God, what are you going to do in me? This year, what are you going to do? How are you going to stir my heart to change things up? And I can promise you this, that God will meet that, that, that call. He will meet your head on saying, you know what? I want to do a new thing in you. Will you trust me to step out, of the, out in faith? You know, we talk about the, the uh, you know, when, when Peter stepped out of the boat, only one guy out of, out of the rest of the uh, 12, or out of the 11 that was left, stepped out. Will you be the one today to step out and say, you know what? I want to be, if no one else steps out, I want to be the guy who steps out today. And I, and I believe with all my heart that God will meet you right there. Because God does not like boxes. You know, if you go back and look through the book of Acts, which we just studied not that long ago, we see God doing something new every single chapter. I mean, in, in chapters 10 and chapters 19, we see an encounter with the Holy Spirit that didn't even look like one another. So in chapters 19, people were saved, baptized in water, and then spoke in tongues. So if we would put God in a box and say, okay, somebody has to be saved, baptized in water, to speak in tongues, that's the way God works. It always has to be that way. Case closed. But if you go back to chapter 10, we didn't see that happen. In chapter 10, they, were, they believed and were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and then they were water baptized. The disciples and the apostles going, what? That's not how you're supposed to do it, God, because this is the way you showed us before. See, God's doing a new thing. He doesn't have to fit inside of our boxes. Just because he did it this way last year doesn't mean we have to do it again this year this way. I want God to have a fresh new thing every single day in my life and in yours. But we have to get the restraints off of God saying, here's how it has to be. Here's what time you start. There's what time you stop preaching. This is how, how many songs we sing. Then we sit down and go home. I don't want that. I told our worship team that clock on the back of the wall at 10 o'clock, the only, only purpose for that clock is to tell me when to start. After that, we can take it off the wall because I don't care. If we're here until 1 o'clock because the Holy Spirit's moving, woo! If you guys want to get up and leave, that's fine. It's more space for me to run. I don't care. <laughs> or you can stay and worship with me. God is stirring in our hearts. As I opened up this morning, I told you, I mean, I, mean, I, I sit back and I'm just like anticipation, like I have no idea what's going to happen next. I mean, when doors open, I'm like, ooh, who's coming in? What's going to happen? What kind of miracle is going to take place today? When we have that expectation in our heart, it opens up the, the avenue for God to work through so much readily. Because, I mean, it just opens them up. So I'm asking you today, what are you going to believe God for this year? What are you going to ask God for? So last week, I told you guys when I announced that we were debt-free that I had a prophetic word to share with you guys. The one that I, was, I received back in, uh, what was it? September, I think. September. Before I share this, the, the prophecy with you guys, I want to give you a little backstory of a dream that I received prior to this prophecy. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is because I want to give you a small teaching on how to receive prophecy correctly. Um, very rarely, and by this I mean like maybe 1% of the time, someone will come to you with a word from the Lord that you have not heard yet. Normally, 99% of the time, the Lord's going to put something on you already, give you that word inside of you, not from another person, and someone else will give you that prophecy to confirm what the Lord's speaking to you. You guys follow with me today? All right? 
The reason I'm sharing it this way is I want you to understand how God works in a normal, you know, proper manner. So back in 2000, I want to say it was either, I think it was 19, early, early, like January in 19, or right after I came here, I forget which one, which one it was, I had a dream about this church, this very building. I remember walking through the glass doors like you guys did this morning and realizing that this place was shoulder to shoulder with people including the bathrooms. The bathroom stalls were full of people that just wanted to be in the house of God, regardless if it's standing next to the urinal or by the altar. They didn't care. They just wanted to be in the house of God. So as I began to come through the sanctuary, I stood in the back corner over there, waiting for the time for me to present the word. When the time was right for me to come forward, I came forward to preach, and the keyboard player, wasn't Ann, um, just made noise. It's like this, bang! Every time I get ready to speak, noise. Boom! I told the sound booth, hey, cut it off, whatever. And this went on several times. Bang! Bang! As soon as the word got ready to come forth, just noise. So finally the sound booth muted the, the, uh, the, the keyboard, and I went to preach. As soon as I began to open my mouth and preach, God took me from this place to the side of an ocean. I know I've shared this with some of you guys, but I want you guys to all get the whole picture now because God's bringing the whole thing into, into focus. God took me from this pulpit to an ocean, standing before the ocean, and I see these waves starting to come in. One, another wave, another wave, and then all of a sudden it came in. Wave, 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 wave. They were getting bigger and stronger, and they were right behind each other, like a storm was coming, but it wasn't, I mean, it was blue skies. It was wave upon wave upon wave upon wave. After I woke up, I asked the Holy Spirit to reveal to me exactly what was going on. And here's what he shared with me. He goes, I'm filling the house up. Praise God, okay? Because we had to get the noise out of the building, which means there were some things going on that we need to take care of. No big deal. God's in that kind of department. And here's the thing. The wave upon wave upon wave, he goes, those are the things I'm about to do in you and through this ministry. One wave did not look like another wave, and it become back to back to back to back. And this is where it brings me to this prophecy. I don't even know where I put it. Oh, I'm way down here. Here we go. Oh. On September 25th, 2021, is when I received this prophecy. Um, this is from a person I did not know very well at the time, okay? Um, there's three separate parts of this prophecy. I'm going to read them to you, and then we'll dissect them accordingly. Um, I'll just read it for you, and then we'll, we'll dive in, okay? Here's how it started out. I got the sense the Holy Spirit was saying that there will be a new move of the Spirit at the church, Prophecy 2. The church building isn't built big enough. It will be filled up with unsuspecting people, those who don't know the Lord, but will come to church because they are curious. They will be saved and need teaching. Here's the third. Extreme debt cancellation. The church's debt will be canceled out far before is expected. I want you to kind of notice right now that the prophecy lined up almost exactly word for word for what my dream was several years prior to this. And I can share this with you. The moment that I began to receive this message from this individual, the Holy Spirit took me right back to that dream instantly. It was confirming instantly. Remember when I showed you this, this lines up. Now one of the things that I am very cautious with as being your pastor is presenting things to you um, that you're not prepared for or maybe off kilter a little bit. I'm not saying this prophecy was off kilter, but I examine everything very carefully for your behalf. I take the shepherding part of my, my job very seriously. I don't want to bring anything to you that's going to bring you hurt or harm or, or confusion. So I held on to this prophecy. I shared it with a few people around me, um, and, but I held on to this asking God, God, show me when exactly I should be sharing this with everybody. And after our debt was canceled, suddenly, kind of like what the prophecy said, I knew this is, this is the time to present this. So it is so awesome to see this, this confirmation of the Word of God right before our eyes. So back in, uh, was it 2020? Is that when the election was? No, it was later than that one. The last election we had with Trump and Biden. All the prophets out there are saying, thus saith the Lord, Trump's going to be reelected, right? It's going to be a red wave, da 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 I don't know if you watched the news or not, but it wasn't, okay? It was false. And I began to wonder, are there any prophets left? 
are there anybody really hearing from God? Because I began to question everything at that point. So as I began to kind of shrink back and ask God, show me what's truly going on. Is there anybody speaking truth? This prophecy here shows me that, yeah, we may not find it on you know, a news network. We may not see it on TBN. The Lord's going to speak to each one of us directly to our hearts and say, I am still speaking, okay? If you're listening. But we have to have our ears attentive to what the Lord's showing us. And one of the things that I do appreciate, probably one of the most things I appreciate about this prophecy is how it began. And here's the words. I got the sense that the Holy Spirit was saying. This person did not say, thus saith the Lord, put the stamp on there. Because you know what? That's a good way to have yourself slapped upside the face. And that's one of the problems I have with a lot of these false prophets that are out there right now saying, thus saith the Lord. No, thus saith you. And it came out to nothing. Because those same prophets said it's going to be a red wave in the midterm. I don't know about you guys, but that was a, maybe a ripple at best. Don't tell me, don't tell me this, thus saith the Lord and get it wrong. Because you know what would happen in the Old Testament if these prophets got, got this wrong? We have a lot of dead prophets. Take them outside the city gate and stone them. Done. We ain't going to listen to this garbage. Now, I'm not saying that's what we need to do to these men and women that's getting it wrong. I'm not saying that. But we need to close our ears off to them and say, Lord, you speak to me. Let the Lord speak to your hearts. Amen? Amen. I don't know where I'm at now. I don't know. Oh, the, the, pro, the, the, the payoff thing. So Marnie and I sat back about a month ago or more looking at the trajectory that we were doing with our mortgage payoff. We were going about 5000 a month toward the mortgage. So we were expecting maybe June, July, maybe August, this would be paid off in full. We're like, what should we do that weekend? I don't know. We'll worry about it when we get there. And then all of a sudden, boom, done. All right. So this is how God did it supernaturally and fast, faster than we expected, because there's the first thing that, had to, that God showed me, you know, on, on this fulfillment of, of this thing. Um, chipping away $5,000 at a time. Sure, that was cool. But that wasn't what God had in mind. God says, I'm going to supernaturally get rid of this debt once and for all. You know, and I think it's so important for us to uh, be watching out. So Matthew chapter 24 tells us repeatedly to watch out for false prophets over and over and over again. It says, watch out, do not be deceived. Even the elect will be deceived. So it doesn't matter how big of a following a person has, doesn't matter how big of a ministry, how long they've been in ministry. If what they're saying does not line up with scripture, throw it away. That's all I got to do. Throw it away. I ain't listening to it. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, it can't be God's Word. Amen? So this other thing about the church is not big enough. That was the other part of the, the, the prophecy and the, and, the, and the vision or dream that God gave me. We're seeing that. Since 2021, our church has tripled in attendance. I don't know if you guys understood that or not, but I'm watching the numbers on the, uh, the directory. We have tripled in size since 2021. And just a few years, just with a year and a half, I mean, here we go. That's a lot of growth. And I don't think God's done. And this is, brings us back to the message today. Do a new thing in me because I need each one of you guys in the fight with me. There's not enough hours in Jason's day to meet all these needs. My job as your pastor is to equip the saints, you guys, to do the work of the ministry. Wherever that's at, whether that be in Tomahawk, you know, Phillips or, or Park Falls, it doesn't matter where God puts you. Do the work of the ministry because God has a work for you to do. Amen? Part of this work of the ministry and stretching you guys, asking God to do more through you guys, means a lot more one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Um, I would love nothing more than to sit down with each one of you guys every single week. But I'm looking around the room and there's not enough hours in the week for me to do so. Even if I only give you five minutes, by the time I make the phone call to the next person, I'm going to be out of time. I'll never have a, a moment to study the Word, prepare for a message. But God has placed you here to do the work of the ministry. And in Titus 2, verses 1 through 8, I'll leave you a moment to get there. So Titus 2, 1 through 8, it shows us where we fit into the mold. Each one of you guys, each one of you guys have a gift, a talent, and an opportunity, and an obligation to do the work of the ministry. Let me show you this, okay? Verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love and endurance. Verse 3. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, 
Do not be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but, that, but teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women, watch this now, okay? Then they can urge the younger women to, li- to love their husbands and their children, to be uh, self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that uh, no one will be mal- maligned with the word of God. So there we go. We already got uh, men and women there. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. And every, everything, set them an example by doing what is good. And your teachings show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech, so they cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you uh, may be, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So all of these areas, it covers everybody from both genders, all age groups, everyone falls in this category that the older men need to be leading the younger men. Amen? Amen. The, young, the older women should be leading the younger women. Amen? Amen? And the younger women and the younger men should be listening and following along. Here's the cool thing that I found out about, that I've been noticing about the generations that we have right now. The generation that's coming into church that are unchurched and un, you know, taught about scriptural stuff, they are hungry. But they're also not arrogant thinking they know everything. This is, this is amazing to me because my generation thought we knew everything. If you don't believe me, just ask me. I still tell you. I know everything. All right? But this generation right now is hungry for truth. I mean, we've watched these things. They, they will take apart anything, any kind of scripture, tear it apart, and ask God to show them what re- what's real. What does this mean to them? Right? So this generation that's coming up in the church right now, they are hungry for teaching. They're hungry for direction. And this is where the older generation, the seasoned veterans of the faith, have so much opportunity to pour into them. See, when I first came to you guys, or come to this church, I thought that having as many retirees as we do was a detriment to us. I'll just be honest with you. I'm like, where in the world, what am I going to do? Where's the energy going to come from? But God soon and very quickly showed me, it's not a dig on you, I promise you, okay? Put the pitchforks and knives down was just a statement. (laughs) What I saw as a detriment, God showed me as a blessing very quickly. Here's how. Because the the ones that are retired have the wisdom, but also the time. That's something that the younger generation don't have because they're running a family, they're running businesses, they're doing the the legwork. So every single one of you retirees, don't think that you're off the hook. You, you, do not, you can retire from your workplace all you want. You never retire from the kingdom of God. You watch the great Billy Graham. He did not retire from ministry. He may have slowed down just a little bit, but man, that guy still had fire in his bones. Pastor Sellers is no, no different. I, I think he's 70 or 93 years old right now, and he still brings the fire. He doesn't care who's around. Everybody's going to know about Jesus when Pastor Sellers is around, right? This is your obligation to the church of Jesus Christ today is to use your gifts, use your experience, use your talents to show the younger generations on how to live, how to study, how to grow, how to be mature in their faith. That's your obligation, church, to the younger generations. Instead of sitting back going, oh, I wish they were different, change them. Teach them. Show them how to love. Show them how to nurture I forget how I was talking to you the other day. I'm like, you know what? I've never learned how to can stuff. I thought it'd be cool to learn how to can. You know who taught me that? Nobody yet. But I know many of you guys in this church know how to can. I'd like to learn. Not for any reason except for I can say I've learned how to can. All right? I know it's completely off base. But how many other things in our life can we say, you know what? I don't know that yet, but they do. How many things do you know and you can do that other people can't and you need to teach them? You know, we got, you guys had a, a basket weaving class what, last year. That was fun to watch you guys. You guys did pretty good, you know. Um, <laughs> mm. Exodus 20, thou shalt not lie. Okay, so you guys did good. You really did. But how many other things in life, not just hands-on stuff, but spiritual things, does the next generation need? This is the ob- obligation to, from you guys that you guys have to get your hands dirty with ministry. Sitting back waiting for someone else, you lose an entire generation doing that. They're hungry. They're ready. God has placed you in their path. So my encouragement to you today is find somebody and partner with them. Go out to lunch. Go grab a cup of coffee. Have them over for a sit-down, whatever. Get to know them. 
Because what I've noticed about the younger generation, they're awesome people. They are so awesome. They're hungry. They're willing. They're ready to go to work. Show them. Show them how to do these things. One of my favorite passages about this new generation is Acts 2.17. And it lines up exactly what the prophet Joel said as well. It says, in the last days, God says, the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I love that. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Well, I've been dreaming dreams for a while, so you can see where I fit. But we have other young men within this church body that have visions and have, uh, have things from the Lord already. Logan is an amazing young man. How old is Logan? 13. Hearing from God. I told that dude, you hear from God, you tell me. The next day, I want to hear about it. Because God has shown me that he is trustworthy. He's not doing it for glitz or glamour or a pat on the back. When God speaks to the young man, he's speaking. Right? And each one of you guys have gifts and talents that you're not using for the kingdom of God. Ask yourself the question, why? Why are you sitting on that? How unfair is that to the rest of us for you to have this wonderful gift from God and you're like, I don't want to use that. Use it for God. Let God be glorified through your hands, through your feet, through your mouth. I appreciate so much the work that you guys do. There's that work of the ministry watching you guys come together as one cohesive unit. It's amazing to me. It truly is. And I can't wait to see what this next year has in store for us. We talked a little bit ago about New Year's resolutions. Let this year's New Year's resolution be, Lord, take the cap off of my faith. For so long, you know, I believe that God was able to do this much in my life. And guess what? He did that much in my life and no more because I didn't expect it more. But after I said, God, what do you want to do through me? All bets are off. You just do whatever you want to do. That is when and only when God showed me his full, my full potential through him. It's nothing about me. I just had to get my hands off and says, God, whatever you want. So this year, I'm going to ask you a question. What do you need from God? What do you expect from God? Is it a miracle? Are you going through some kind of physical ailment right now that you're tired of? And you say, God, you healed the lepers. You healed the blind. You healed the deaf. You raised the dead. You told Ezekiel to speak to dry, dead bones, and it came to life. Can you do that through me? Will you do that through me? Maybe it's your marriage that's smoldering at best. Speak to that marriage and say, in the name of Jesus, come to life. Your finances, whatever else it is that you're facing in life, God is the answer. Ask Him for miracles. Expect miracles. Let this day be the launching pad for the rest of your life, believing that God wants to do a great thing through you. I'll be your biggest cheerleader, don't get me wrong, but through God you can do anything. So no matter where your imagination stops, ask God to take you further than that. Take the lid off of your faith and do a new work in me in 23. Amen? Let's pray. Father, it has been an amazing day in your house. And Lord, I know we have not even seen anything yet. Lord, I pray a blessing over this church. I pray that every single member of this church, Father, will receive your marching orders to show them where they are to serve, how they are to love, what gifts they are supposed to utilize every single day. Open their eyes to their full potential through you, God. I pray, Lord, that you unleash your Holy Spirit and just pour out, just pour it out, Lord. Let us feel the tangible feel of your presence here. Go with us, Lord. Let us be your hands and feet and amaze us, Father, at the things that you have in store for us. I thank you, Father. I love you and I praise you.